Welcome back to Obsession Engineering at Honda Racing in Louth and Harry is just prepping us for the dyno. So just before I loaded the bike into the van yesterday, I realised that the left hand switch gear wasn't doing anything. You could press all the buttons you wanted and nothing happened. And so I did a bit of head scratching and there is a plug down here that isn't connected to anything and I kept looking and there is absolutely nothing in the kit loom for it to attach to. Uh, that's not for that. So um, I was a bit head scratching to wonder what was going on and then I realised that it might be the big plug back here that I assumed was for probably the data logger and it isn't. It connects into this like little ECU which is I assume for controlling sort of the traction control and some of the non-engine side stuff and so I had a dig in the standard loom that we had upstairs, found that box, plugged it in and now everything works which is a bonus because otherwise it would have been slightly embarrassing turning up a Honda with a bike that didn't work properly. Having checked a couple of fault codes and cleared some of them, we found out that the uh, steering damper fault code was still up, but in the map that these boys had told me, it wasn't even connected, it was told the steering had to be off. Um, so then I realised I must have done something wrong, so I've had, I've had the laptop plugged into it again, um, and actually getting it to send the map to the bike was the bit I'd messed up. We've got four power runs there on the graph in different colours and these are just different places where Harry's picked the throttle up but they're all basically doing 209 horsepower at the wheel. Um, there's a little bit of a lower one at the end there but yeah I think 209 horsepower should keep Franco fairly busy. So it's 209 horsepower and 110 newton metres of torque. What that trace leads here into foot pounds that we normally use I have no idea. I've got one more thing I want to test and I want to test the bike with the baffle in the pipe. Now obviously I'm expecting it to lose horsepower but what I don't want it to do is completely ruin the torque curve and mess up the fueling. I just want to know that we can run the baffle without having any problems when we get to track. Comparing the uh, last power runs with the baffle in compared to the last one with the baffle out it's only really past 13 and a half thousand rpm that it makes any real difference the torque is within one newton meter difference and even at the peak we're only talking four three four five horsepower so what we know from that is even if you want to be a little bit quieter you're still going to be going plenty fast enough so that's it from our dyno session. The bike is fit and healthy and I've also got to play with a few of the settings and bits as well, which is always useful. Now I need to take it back to the workshop and actually make it ready to go on track. The bike performed faultlessly on the dyno, but there is a few bits I need to do before we go on track. The first thing I'm going to do is change our pristine 30th anniversary edition painted fuel tank and put on a different tank that we got from Honda and I also need to fit the rear shock and then fit the bodywork because otherwise it'll get a bit windy. This fuel tank is coming off because basically it's too nice to go racing with because we're going to paint it and at some point Franco's going to crash it we're going to take this off and put it with the rest of the pristine body kit and in its place I'm going to fit this fuel tank this may look like original Honda paint, but it's not. This was actually painted for Tom Neve's Superstock bike a couple of years ago, and Honda kept it as a spare. But they don't need it anymore, and we do need it. So all I've got to do is whip the other tank off, swap the fuel pump and the filler cap over, job sorted. I like standard filler caps. 
all these aftermarket ones where there's little fiddly bits to turn and little bits you could drop on the floor and generally the faff of them, standard filler caps are easy. You put the key in, you turn it, it opens, it seals properly, it closes. It is a masterpiece of simple engineering. But I don't want to have to use the key. So what I'm going to do is take this standard filler cap and I'm going to take the locker mechanism out of it so I can fit a screwdriver instead. So every manufacturer seems to have a slightly different way of making these filler caps. So I've already taken some screws and plates and bits out and basically I just need to keep taking it apart, screw by screw, like the one down there, until I can actually slide the part that is the lock mechanism away from the actual body of the filler cap. Turns out that was relatively simple. So what I need to do now with this is, firstly, get the key out of it, which will involve uh, pressing some of these pins in to sort of release the key. And then I need to actually take all of these little sliders out, because they're the bits that sit in the indentations of the key, and basically make this lock mechanism unique to this key. So if I take these out, then the barrel will be able to turn with anything inserted in it. In my case, hopefully, a screwdriver. So as you can see now, I have the lock barrel in, and I can turn it with the screwdriver, and when I turn it, these pins down here pop in, and if I push the locking gate down, they pop back out again, which returns the lock barrel to its locked position. So open, unlocked. So I now have a filler cap that just needs popping back together so I can actually undo my filler cap and fill my bike with petrol without a key. So I now have a standard filler cap that can be opened with a screwdriver. Perfect! So I've got most of the petrol out of it but there'll always be a little bit in the bottom so I've not got it completely inverted. Uh, I've also got it on some tyres so it doesn't get marked on the floor. Next thing I need to do is undo these nuts and extract the pump and when the pump's out then I can get a big funnel and pour the last of the fuel into a jerry can. So this is it. This is my Honda fuel pump dribbling fuel onto the floor as I do it. There's a reason I'm working by the door with the door very wide open. So all I need to do is slot that in the big hole there. Nice and easy. So I could dive in and just refit the fuel tank, but there is another job I am doing first. And this is to aid rear shock removal. The lads at Honda have told me it's a lot easier if I cut a section of the under tray out. I decided it was going to be much easier to take the under tray out of the bike to cut it, especially because there's not that much wiring loom down the back of here. So a few minutes with the Dremel and there we go. A big hole that should make taking the shock out a little bit easier. Turns out it's much easier to get the shock out if you take that section of linkage out because then the bottom of the shock clears everything a little bit easier. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and measure this shock and get its length written down so I know exactly what standard ride height is. Then I'm going to go and get my Batubo shock out of a box, set it to Honda's recommended shock length and slot it in the hole in there. And this is ideal time for playing around, seeing which bits of the linkage and bits you have to take off, because it'd be a bit of a faff for doing this 10 minutes before a qualifying session if you weren't sure what you were doing. So interestingly, the data that Honda gave me as their sort of recommended base setting is basically the same shock length and nearly the same spring rates as the standard road shock. So it goes to tell you that Honda did the correct thing originally. So this shock is a tiny bit softer sprung than the original Olin shock, but then it's only designed for one person, not two. And I've also remeasured the spring uh, and written on there exactly how long the spring is, because when you're doing preloads, half a millimetre actually makes a difference when you're as fast as Franco. So I've double checked all the settings. I've got a preload setting, the damping settings as per Bitubo's recommendation. And these shocks have high and low speed rebound and compression, or in fact, rebound that side compression that side so the next thing to do is slot this one in the bike and do everything back up so while I had the back wheel out which made changing the shock considerably easier because you can get more movement on the swinging arm I decided it was a good opportunity to clean all the chain lube off the inside of the swinging arm and all around the sprockets and everything because it was a new chain there was quite a lot of grease and bits so that is now lovely and clean uh, I took out the uh, axle adjusting bolts and lubricated them with a bit of copper slip because they will go forwards and backwards quite a lot so 
it's always nice to have a little bit of assistance for them. I've changed the gearing. We're now onto a 44 tooth rocket, which is what Honda recommend as a good base setting. And that has put us pretty much bang in the middle of the chain adjusters, which is generally a fairly good place to be starting. While I was down here doing chains and sprockets and stuff, I thought I'd better fit the HRC shark fin. Conveniently, because it is genuine Honda, there are actually holes drilled in the bottom of the swinging arm for it, so that was nice and easy. So it's been another busy day in the workshop, but we've made excellent progress on the Fireblade. It's been on the dyno, it's got the right gearing in it, it's got the right shock in it, uh, it's got a good base setting in it. The only thing really left to do before it goes on track is fit some bodywork and put more petrol in it. So after a relatively late finish yesterday, the only thing I've got to do to the bike today is get the bodywork on. So let's dilly dally in, I best get cracking. So this is the fairing we're going to be fitting to the Fireblade, and it is Carbonin Avio Fibre, basically their name for fiberglass. Now Carbonin stuff is expensive as far as fiberglass bodywork goes. A set for the Fireblade is around £1,000, but the reason it's expensive is it fits really, really well. The quality of this stuff is beyond anything I've seen from any other fiberglass manufacturer. So this, hopefully, will be a nice quick fit on that Fireblade. As well as all the actual main body panels, we also have 3D printed uh, sort of spoiler bits that go in the gills. And then we have fitting kits. So this is the seat unit fitting kit. And then there's an airbox cover bit and one bit for the normal fairing brackets for the side panels and bits. And then Zeus fasteners, a selection of little screws which will be for holding uh, those bits into the panels, I suspect. So what I need to do first is probably fit the airbox cover stuff because generally that has to go on first. Stage one was pretty easy. Bolt these uh, Zeus clip brackets onto there. I just have to trim a little bit more off the under tray, the little bits that stick up to get that on. The next bit took a little bit more work because the IMU that we've got up here, that sticks up further than the old steering lock thing that was on there. And the uh, kits obviously been moulded off the road kit stuff, which had less of a hump there. So what I've had to do is trim a bit out of the panel. So marker pen, Dremel, five minutes work, chunk cut out. So that should now fit, but I'm gonna bolt it on first, check it actually fits, and then take it back off and tidy up the edges a bit. So with minor pulling and pushing that has fitted, half the game you have with fiberglass, especially if it turns up in a box, is it can distort a little bit when it's not fitted to a bike. So this one's just taking a little bit of a pull to get these front two bolts in, but the back's not went in nice and easily, and the fit is pretty snug. Um, I am going to put a little bit of fuel pipe around the edges of these bits where they run on the frame so it doesn't mark the frame up too quickly, but it's looking pretty good. I'm just going to tidy these bits up and then it can have a final fitting. All I've done down the edges of the panels here is slit some uh, fuel pipe open and stick it to the panel so that it doesn't rub on the frame because there's nothing worse than having a rub mark all the way along your frame where your bodywork's been sat. So I've just cleaned this up a little bit with the Dremel as well. That's bolted together. And I've also, while the glue was setting on the um, fuel pipe, fitted the hardware for the seat. So underneath the seat, there's two little bobbins that slide into these bits. And then the seat bolts down to this bolt here, this uh, bracket here, which fixes to the standard seat mounting points. If you had a superbike subframe, then it would mount to these points, but we don't, so it's easy. So next thing to do is slide the seat unit on. So now I have the fixings down here and the support on, the seat literally just slides on. Because it's the first time it's been on, it did take just a little bit of shoving with the palm of my hand to get all the holes to line up. And then I realised I actually need to bolt the seat pad on to there before I put the seat on and then use this clip through the seat unit. So I shall take that back off again, bolt the seat pad on. The most terrifying bit about fitting fairing is normally drilling the screen. But because this is a high quality fairing, and we've bought some relatively posh screens as well, all of the holes came pre-drilled and all the bolts lined up. Winner! Right, the next trick to get the top fairing to fit is I've put a riv nut in there. Uh, and that just means I can screw straight into there and I don't need a nut on the back, because that would just be poor form. Moving on to my left hand side panel, 
and it took me a few minutes to just bolt the little sort of fin spoiler thing in there, the wing in it, uh, and then the biggest job was actually relocating the uh, wiring for this because the wiring that comes from the generator up to the reg rack was sitting just there because it was nice and easy to get to and I've moved it so it's now tucked up inside the frame rail. It was a little bit fiddly to get everything to actually fit correctly in there but that gives us a load more space here and it means if Franco crashes it it doesn't just rip the wiring straight out the side of the bike which is a bit of a bonus. Right hand side panel has gone on almost as easily as the left, in fact actually even easier really because I didn't have to relocate any electrics. Uh, it's using the standard mounting points for the top fairing, so one mounts onto the uh, water bottle on the other side and this is on the standard fairing bracket. All I am going to do in here is just trim a few millimetres out of the inside of the panel when I take it off again because it's just, just touching the, fair, uh, the radiator and what I don't want it to do when we're using it is fret through the radiator because that would be terrible. So I am going to take it off and tweak it in a bit but and before that I'm going to have a go at fitting the belly pan. So I really was hoping that I'd get away with leaving the side stand on with the fairing panel on. On the carbonin kit I've got on my BMW you can have the side stand and the fairing but on this you can't. The advantage of having the side stand on especially when the bike's in and out of the workshop and just on sort of test days is pulling it in and out of the van, in and out of sessions, you can just chuck the side stand down. It's easy. I leave side stands on track bikes if I can because it just makes life easier. But I can't because the fairing doesn't fit. So now I've got to take that off and just swap that round for the bracket that comes with the spider rear set to hold the gear lever on. Not a big job, just another one to tick off the list. That's been pretty good progress. It's taken me probably two and a half hours to get all of the bodywork onto the bike. Now that might seem like a long time, but trust me in the world of race bodywork, that's pretty quick going. And that includes building all the little panels up and putting the brackets on and actually trimming a few little bits here and there. All the bits I've trimmed, we didn't really strictly have to do it. It's just gonna make life a little bit better and hopefully make the bike a little bit more reliable in service because we won't be rubbing on things. So we have plenty of clearance around the exhaust pipes inside the belly pan, plenty of clearance around the water pipes and bits inside the uh, side panels and all the uh, wiring and brake lines and bits like that nothing's rubbing which is brilliant because anything that rubs eventually is going to wear out so this is looking considerably more like a race bike ah bit of a note though uh, the mud guards haven't turned up yet if it comes to it we'll just put one of the standard ones on or if it's a sunny dry day not bother with the mud guard at all so along with the front mudguard, there is a couple of other little jobs I need to do at some stage. Uh, we have to have a breather bottle from the fuel tank, uh, and that's going to be buried up in the nose cone, and I need to put some pipes to it, but that's not critical at this stage. Uh, I will need to fit a rain light, but that will fit with the logger wiring that we don't have yet, so that's a job for another day. Uh, and I need to mock up the thumb brake. Uh, to make sure everything fits in this clearance and then get a brake line the right length for it so that when we want to test it we've got all the stuff ready. So as with many projects it's not actually finished but it is finished enough to take it to a racetrack and actually get it shaken down. We'll be going testing with the bodywork unpainted but before the start of the season we will of course be spreading some wonderful colours across the fire blade. If you would like your name or your business name down the side of the Honda, you can get in touch with us through the email address I've put in the description and we'll find a wonderful way to get you involved in our project. So thank you for watching and join me again next time when we'll be getting the Honda going round in circles.